Welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare, a podcast featuring thought-provoking conversations about the latest legal, policy, and regulatory issues in healthcare. While these issues may seem like hurdles, we'll also look at the business opportunities and solutions that exist. Diagnosing Healthcare is brought to you by the healthcare lawyers at Epstein Becker Green, a leading law firm that has more than 40 years experience serving clients in the healthcare industry nationwide. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare. I'm Tim Murphy, an attorney in Epstein Becker and Green's healthcare and life sciences practice in our Washington, D.C. and Boston offices. I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, we are going to discuss the health policy outlook following the 2020 election. Specifically, we're going to discuss three areas where there is bipartisan interest in reform, addressing prescription drug prices, addressing surprise billing rules, and upcoming potential for coronavirus relief. Then we are going to discuss the prospects of a coverage expansion or retraction following the 2020 election. But before we begin, I would like to take a few moments to clarify a couple of matters. First, we are going to be focusing on the policy implications of the election. We are certain that our conversation will touch upon the legislative and administrative process and therefore necessarily touch upon the politics. But EBG does not endorse either of the presidential candidates nor a political party. Second, we are recording this the morning of October 15th, so events may have changed between the time we finish recording and then you listen to our podcast. With that out of the way, I'm going to introduce today's guests. With me here today are three of my colleagues, Lynn Shapiro-Snyder. Lynn is a senior partner in EBG's Washington, D.C. office. She's also a strategic counsel with EBG Advisors and National Health Advisors. Philo Hall. Philo is a senior counsel in EBG's Washington, D.C. office and prior to joining the firm, served in the Bush administration with roles in the Department of Health and Human Services and in the White House Domestic Policy Council. And finally, Ted Kennedy Jr., a partner in our Stanford, Connecticut office, and a former Connecticut state senator. Digging into our conversation, our first topic is addressing the cost of prescription drugs, an issue the Trump administration has tried a variety of approaches to in the last four years, including the recent attempt to make direct payments to Medicare beneficiaries. I'm going to start with Ted. Regardless of which party is in the White House or the Capitol, there seems to be a bipartisan appetite for addressing prescription drug pricing or prescription drug costs. What type of policies do you expect to see come to the forefront in 2021? Well, thank you very much for having us all on the on this podcast. The area of high cost of pharmaceuticals is an area that has been addressed really by both political parties, which is why We believe, no no matter what the outcome of this upcoming election, there will be action on prescription drug pricing. Now, there's many different uh, ways in which to address the high cost of pharmaceuticals, but in the area of things like external reference pricing or international pricing, importation or re-importation, as some may call it, and increasing generic supply and access to drugs are some of the are just the three strategies that both the Democrats and Republicans have embraced. Thank you. Is there a specific policy where we think that, that there's a break between the current White House and maybe the Bi- a Biden White House, Lynn? There may not be a, uh, a bright line because right now it's not 100 percent clear exactly what can be accomplished in the Congress and what type of Congress we're looking at post-election. So historically, it was more that the Democrats were willing to take on pricing generally at the federal level when the private sector market isn't working for the consumer. However, there are Republicans who are willing to take on this particular issue because it really is affecting a lot of a lot of Americans. And so uh, I think there are points where everyone is frustrated with the fact that the rest of the world is able to cost shift and have our uh, country disproportionately pay for the price of prescription drugs. However, the solutions is where I call it the devil is in the details. Philo, I know you had some time on Capitol Hill. Can you talk a little bit about what you think are some of the challenges in getting some solution here? 
Well, uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Tim and Ted. I think that's the right way to frame it, Lynn, that there are challenges in getting to a solution here. And in fact, I'll take a moment to emphasize that it truly is an issue for Congress, regardless of what the Trump administration's views might be or the Biden administration's uh, views. For example, in September, the Trump administration, the Trump White House released a series of executive orders addressing uh, prescription drug pricing. And we have told a number of clients that these, in a sense, were political campaign announcements. And, and that's, that's for two reasons. One, an executive order in most cases really is just directing agencies to take later regulatory action. They very rarely have legal force in and of themselves. And two, a lot of the different prescription drug policies that were proposed in these uh, Trump White House executive orders were issues that, or, or policies that the administration proposed previously in the last three years or so. For instance, modifying anti-kickback safe harbor regulations to limit rebates uh, between drug manufacturers and uh, PBMs, and uh, setting the uh, most favored nation model for uh, lowering prices for drugs under Medicare Part B. These are a host of policies that the Trump administration previously proposed and withdrew or proposed and then got stuck up in uh, litigation from pharmaceutical manufacturers or others. So while a, I would say a, either a Trump or Biden administration has very limited room to administratively alter prescription drug price policy within say the Medicare Part D program, but very little authority to make these big changes, which is why it comes back to Congress. It has to come back to Congress. And uh, that the challenges I think that, that Lynn was you know, keying up is that they're not necessarily Republican or Democrat issues. Uh, I, I think the, the prescription drug pricing policy world in general is becoming less black and white Republican and Democrat and more to what degree constituencies in Capitol Hill appreciate or are, are cognizant of the concerns of prescription drug manufacturers or the concerns of payers, be that the Medicare program or commercial payers who would like to see lower prices for prescription drugs. You know, I'll, I'll just add one, one last point, sort of if, if I may prognosticate a bit. There are, you know, there's a host of different ideas offered by Republicans and Democrats in Congress for prescription drug price reform over the last few years. Uh, such as you know, government price negotiation for drugs, PBM reforms, uh, requiring a review of excessive prices. But what I think is the easiest policy that is most likely to get bipartisan agreement is if Congress were to modify the Medicare Part D program and ask both manufacturers and commercial Medicare Part D plans to take up a greater share of the cost of coverage of Part D drugs, and perhaps even have the federal government take up an easier share. It is easier, and instead of working through you know, controversial policies over who's really gonna be harmed the most, uh, which industry would be harmed the most uh, to lower prescription drug prices, it is sometimes easier just for the federal government to pay more and ask all the parties to pay a little bit more for Part D coverage. Let me just add something. We talk about drugs like they're all the same widget, and they're not. Some of the pricing challenges have come more from the different therapies that are more in the specialized pharmaceutical area. Um, and I wanted to just uh, maybe pose to Ted, in terms of innovation, balancing innovation with pricing, some of the most innovative drugs are coming from this area. Do you think that the whatever solution comes here might be for a subsection of the pharmaceutical industry rather than targeting the entire industry? Well, that's a good question, Lynn. Um, I think there's lack of patience with these, you know, so-called Me Too drugs that are very costly and really don't have, um, you know, better clinical effectiveness as the counterparts that are currently on the market. So I see, you know, uh, efforts to maybe do com some comparative effectiveness initiatives to to benchmark the drugs against one another. But I I agree with you know Philo that you know there are many different levers and strategies from you know patent reform or pay for delay to international price benchmarking to fast tracking generic approvals 
the bottom line is Vilo mentioned obviously the the major pharmaceutical companies that are uh, alarmed and upset by all the discussions relating to the high cost of, of prescription drugs and the payers obviously don't don't want to get stuck with holding the bag on this. I think that this is really a consumer issue and between this issue that we are talking about now, pharmaceutical prices, and the next issue that we'll be talking about in a few moments around surprise billing are, are really, I think, a reflection of the new consumerism, the advancement of consumerism in healthcare today, where people, uh, companies, and manufacturers need to be much more aware of the consumer, and the consumer is getting much more savvy in terms of what they're demanding, what they're paying. I think as long as this is a top consumer issue, that's going to be driving the um, Congress to come up with specific solutions. So I do think that there are a lot of overlaps between what the House Democrats want, what the Senate Republicans want, what the current Trump administration wants. So I think there's the makings of reforms underway, but Philo is correct. It's not just, can't just be done by administrative action. It has to be done through legislation. Thanks, Ted. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to transition there to our next topic. I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Lynn, because I know this is an issue that you've been following very closely. Surprise billing. It's, it's an area where there's been a lot of movement and a significant push to address through legislation the last year. Can you give us a, an overview of the practice and the legislation that's been proposed to change it and maybe tell us a little bit about where you think the ball's going? Sure, Tim. Um, and thank you, Ted, for laying it up so well, because it is about the consumer. So you're a consumer and you decide to go get a service at, let's say, at a facility or even a surgery center. And you think you're at an in-network provider. And then all of a sudden, a month later, you start getting a bill and it's for the maybe the pathology or the anesthesiologist, um, and they were out of network because they are separate providers. So technically, if you wanted to make sure you were in network, you would want to first ask your facility provider if all the health professionals who will be billing on your behalf are all in network, but that's a more sophisticated question than most consumers would know how to ask. Indeed, uh, just recently, there was a study done by the University of Virginia and University of Michigan researchers. They only looked at one large payer, but over a million claims, but it was over a very long time period, 2012 to 2017. 12% of the screening colonoscopies ended up with out-of-network billings for the anesthesiologists and for pathologists. And the average surprise bill was about $418. And it's that noise, similar to the noise we hear about drug pricing and how consumers can't afford, and they think they have insurance and they think maybe they're underinsured, that is creating the discussions on Capitol Hill in particular, whether it has to be a federal solution or a state-based solution, at least for surprise billing, that is the question. With drug pricing, I find it's much harder for a state to try and legislate, but for uh, surprise billing, we've already had some states come up with some solutions that appear to be working. So why do these contracts happen? A lot of it is supply and demand of the private sector and the willingness of providers and payers to come to some mutual agreement. So if we don't want that to happen, there's legislation pending on the Hill that is bipartisan, but it doesn't mean it's bipartisan and bicameral, which means bipartisan in both houses. And whether there's enough momentum and what I call political capital that they're willing to spend on pushing it compared to all the other issues like drug pricing that they have on their plate. And I know that one of the things that Ted, Philo, and I talk about in our free time with each other is this whole issue of the lame duck Congress, which is always a different kind of Congress than when it's before the election. And there'll be members of the House and Senate who will 
uh, no longer have to vote party lines because uh, they're not going to be back in January anyway. And we have seen some very major legislation get through Congress by one vote during lame duck. But for surprise billing right now, if you look at what's on Capitol Hill, the focus is, is on, yes, we don't like surprise billing. Yes, we want the consumer to pay maybe in network for the affiliated providers when the consumer didn't know that there were these other providers. But nobody can agree on whether the federal government should set a benchmark price, which you would think would not be a Republican-oriented policy, uh, versus going to arbitration or giving the parties like 30 days to come to an agreement, um, or trying to figure out access to an in-network price, which would not be fair to the provider community when they were unwilling to agree to that price in the marketplace. The one thing you don't hear as much about is transparency. And there is a move to, for consumerism, as Ted mentioned, to have more transparency around pricing and more transparency around who is in network. And I think that perhaps one of the ultimate solutions here is going to be putting more emphasis on transparency so that these uh, mistakes do not occur or that they are being done consciously by the consumer and the providers. And perhaps that's where surprise billing might be headed. Ted, what do you think about surprise billing? The number of um, providers that are not in network, that are suddenly uh, consumers are getting these outrageous bills, um, has put this issue front and center, which is why I think both political parties are interested in taking up this issue. I actually had one follow-up for you. As, as Lynn noted, there are states that are trying to address this. I just have to think that states are going to have so much on their plate when their legislative sessions start again with dealing with the response to the coronavirus. And I didn't know if you thought that they, as a former state legislature and, and a leadership and leader in that body, whether you thought that states really had the capacity to start addressing this next year. Well, Tim, I think that's a good question. Obviously, we're here today to talk about federal policy um, in the upcoming elections. But I think it's a fair point that um, since there has been so much gridlock and partisan hyperpartisanship in Washington, D.C. today, many health reforms are originating at the state level. And there's been many, when I was a state legislator in Connecticut, for example, we had numerous uh, initiatives to address the issue of pharmaceutical pricing, surprise billing, and others. I just want to mention, uh, as you know, that I'm a foremost uh, disability rights activist, and we have a number of issues um, originating at the state level. For example, in California, recent Senate Bill 855, signed by Gavin Newsom, recently the strongest mental health parity law in the country now. So you're going to see other states pick up on those initiatives, those successful state initiatives, because, because of the partisan gridlock. You saw this through years ago, the drive-through deliveries and other health plan reforms. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see that as long as your hyperpartisanship uh, remains in Washington, D.C. I'd like to follow up on um, uh, another good point that, that Lynn teed up um, regarding the hyperpartisanship and a path forward on, on surprise billing, and that is transparency. So as Congress may continue, this is sort of the opposite of what we were saying before um, with prescription drug pricing being something that cannot be done administratively. There's certainly going to be continued action coming out of any administration on healthcare price transparency. So while, yes, I, I think it will be interesting to see if a lame duck uh, session or, or a next Congress can break through this gridlock on whether you resolve surprise billing through arbitration or benchmark prices. Um, the Trump administration has certainly been trying to do a lot on increasing price transparency. And that is over the last um, year, putting in place new requirements for hospitals to disclose standard prices. It's just going into effect for, for uh, 2021. Hospitals have to publicly disclose not only the prices that they charge to payers for common procedures, but hospitals now are required to disclose their privately negotiated rates with 
different commercial payers. So what does Hospital X uh, get paid by uh, the local BCBS plan for a knee replacement? What does the hospital get paid by Humana for the same knee, re knee replacement? And it is, I think, the attempt of the administration that flooding the market with more information about what providers and payers actually negotiate amongst themselves may put some downward pressure on what those prices are and empower consumers to not be uh, the recipient of surprise bills or what may seem like excessive prices. And this is interesting for two, two reasons. One is uh, the American Hospital Association has currently gone to court to, to block this regulation. I think it's very interesting to see how that will play out. A lot of the major payers, like the American Health Insurance Plan Association, AHIP, um, also opposes the regulation. They haven't joined the, the litigation, but they're opposing it. Um, and so there's, there's a question one of how this litigation will proceed. And then let's say there's a Biden administration. How will they take up price transparency regulations that the Trump administration has set up? They are very controversial regulations. And I, I'm very curious to see uh, would a Biden administration continue those or uh, make them more rigorous or maybe scale them back a bit? It is interesting that um, maybe when you change the framework of an issue, as Ted and Lynn are saying, from something that's a black and white issue to more of a consumer focused issue, you find new ways of looking at a problem where you know, each administration and each party may be more comfortable putting forward some aggressive regulation. Yeah, one last closing comment on surprise billing, which is there is reticence to set a benchmark. Um, whenever the Congress and the administrations pass a law with a real price in it, <laughs> it creates unintended consequences. So I think people prefer generally to let the free market do what it needs to do to get a mutually agreed upon price. However, um, the transparency, even if it's just at the moment of service, they have to disclose to you as they do their privacy rights policy, they have to disclose to you what your potential out-of-pockets are, may be the kind of uh, solution that groups of people could be willing to tolerate at the federal level because it doesn't necessarily create that chilling effect. On the other hand, as Philo said, people want to keep their pricing confidential as a competitive advantage. So these are the different tennis balls that are in the air when it comes to surprise billing. They can agree on the statement of the problem, but the bottom line is there's no agreement on what the solution is. Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to turn back to Philo on another area where we have a, an agreement on what the problem is. Um, unfortunately, it's in the background of everything we've done the most of this year, and that's the coronavirus. Wanted to see, Philo, what your thoughts on potential additional stimulus or additional relief for healthcare providers, either in a lame duck or in 2021. And then also, there was a bunch of regulatory relief in late March, early April that added flexibility to providers, a lot of new um, services that can be provided via telehealth for under a temporary um, orders. Any potential for that stuff to become permanent and, and what should providers be thinking about in that way? Yes, thank you, Tim. Great question. And there, there really are two main issues that we are tracking and that we think providers and stakeholders in the healthcare system should be uh, tracking that, that are very interesting short-term and long-term issues. The first is congressional coronavirus relief or what is sometimes called coronavirus stimulus. Since the pandemic hit, you know, in, in February through April, we saw Congress act very quickly three times with three major bills that gave the administration more regulatory flexibility to assist um, the healthcare system and a whole lot of cash. I'll just put it that way, a whole lot of financial support for states, for localities, for providers, and a whole lot of other entities in the whole economy. We called them um, coronavirus you know, bills one through three. And then back in April, they were Congress was talking about when will we have coronavirus relief bill number four, and it was planned for May. And here we are in October, just a few weeks before the election, and I think Congress has given up on the idea of being able to come to agreement on that. And it, and it, is, it is over, you know, what is the size of the relief bill? Somewhere between $3 trillion and half a trillion dollars are the different bills that we're seeing out of Congress. 
but there is agreement that there is more uh, financial and regulatory relief needed by the healthcare system. Uh, I think both Republicans and Democrats have proposed adding more funding for the provider relief fund. That's the, the grant pot of money that HHS distributes to providers based on uh, need and impact of the coronavirus epidemic, where Congress has given $175 billion uh, to be distributed already. And that's almost, but not quite all distributed. There is a demand among providers for more provider relief funds. I think the healthcare system is also looking for more funds for a more national coordinated testing strategy, particularly uh, empowering states to have localized testing strategies. Another source of relief that Congress gave to providers was to give them what's called Medicare accelerated and advanced payments, basically several months of their average Medicare reimbursement up front, but it was a loan. CMS gave out $100 billion in advanced loan payments of Medicare advanced and accelerated payments. And so uh, that became very difficult for providers to pay back. So Congress just a few weeks ago extended the repayment timeframe for those accelerated and advanced payments. But a lot of providers are asking also for forgiveness of those loans. Between more provider relief funds, potential forgiveness of advanced and accelerated payments, funds for testing strategies, you know, and, and many other provisions. There, there is demand in the healthcare system for another, there is need for another bill. It's not going to happen in the short term, I think. One, because um, I, I think things are just a little too partisan and political right now until after the election. It is, I, I think, this lame duck period between the election and, um, and the inauguration, particularly in December, Congress has to act again um, by, I think, the 12th of December to uh, pass a budget for the government for 2021, that would be a time to look for a, um, finally, a brokering of a deal on a next round of coronavirus stimulus. I, I think the only thing that might limit that, or I think the only thing that, that Congress might be hesitant about is trying to project the need of the healthcare system based on the severity of the um, pandemic this winter. We're seeing in a number of states, and we're seeing around the world, COVID cases spike again. I think a tough issue for, for Congress will be trying to project what the needs of the healthcare system will be through the winter with the seasonal flu on top of the COVID pandemic. How much of an impact will that be? Do we need, a, do we need to double the funding we've done so far or just a small portion? The second question is, yes, Congress has been acting throughout the year, not just in giving out money, but giving, empowering CMS to do regulatory relief, to make it easier to process payments, reimburse providers, uh, get care to uh, patients and beneficiaries who need it uh, in those cases where standard Medicare regulations may have stood in the way or may other ways block just providers delivering the care they need. A lot of that was around um, relaxing scope of practice rules, uh, around rules for face-to-face -face visits before care can be provided or before claims can be submitted for new services. And a lot of that is empowered through expanded coverage of telehealth, which sets up the second interesting question for, I would say, 2021. Of these many regulatory relief um, provisions which impacted the entire healthcare system, which will last beyond the COVID pandemic. There is agreement that some are going to last beyond the pandemic. And the CMS administrator, Seema Verma herself, has even said that um, some of these policies will last. And that's a, that's a question for CMS and, um, and Congress. I think you mentioned uh, telehealth. Uh, I wonder if um, Ted or Lynn have any thoughts on you know, telehealth and what else might be now determined not to be a, a COVID expediency policy, but a, a policy that the healthcare system definitely needs going forward, a policy that has proved itself. Well, I think, um, Philo, you gave a really good explanation of uh, the types of regulatory and sub-regulatory changes that have happened as a result of the pandemic and which ones are likely to continue, namely telehealth, which is of course expanded rapidly uh, reimbursement, a lot of the rules regarding where the calls can originate from and 
and um, state licensure questions and so on. I just wanted to also mention the impact, for example, on nursing homes. And uh, these are high risk facilities. And we know from statistics that um, only, you know, 11% of the cases in the United States, but 40% of COVID-19 deaths were from nursing homes and other congregate care facilities. So many of these facilities are facing will continue to face challenges and potential lawsuits for uh, not having responded quickly enough, et cetera, and wondering if there may be some kind of congressional immunity be granted, and also allowing additional flexibility, such as you mentioned before, scope of practice to allow practitioners to do certain things in these facilities that they they wouldn't be uh, allowed or, or reimbursed for in the past. So I do think that there are a number of items uh, as a result of COVID-19 that will continue to uh, remain even after the pandemic is over. Lynn, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I would also say similar to what you both have said, but the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation provides statutory authority for CMS to experiment. And if the experiment works well, it can then become a part of the Medicare program nationwide without an amendment to the law. So assuming that CMMI survives the Supreme Court, (laughs) which is a big assumption, a lot of these waivers could be converted into CMMI projects. And the beauty of CMMI also is that it goes, we have private payers, Medicaid and Medicare, all coordinating under the CMMI projects on many of them. So it's, it's another administrative way to accomplish this, even if Congress does not act. I do want to mention that in November, we will be back with an episode specifically on the Supreme Court case that Lynn is referencing. So tune in in the middle of November. Uh, Stuart Gerson, uh, another partner at Epstein, Decker & Green, and I will be covering that case. But I did want to take a moment before we sign off to talk about the chances or the opportunities for coverage expansion after the election. I know we've heard a lot about Medicare for all in the media or a public option in the media or repeal and replace in the media. And talking the other day to Ted, I know you had some thoughts on what might actually happen here. So I wanted to to give you a chance to talk about that. Well, all this is a big if, as you know, Tim, a public option or Medicare for all or uh, expansion of Obamacare would only happen of course, if there were a change in the White House and a Biden administration. And, but the Democrats are keen to establish a public option. And there really are three different choices, a public option, a Medicare for all, or lowering Medicare to to 60, which uh, Kamala Harris uh, mentioned again in a recent vice presidential debate. I think Medicare for all is seen as a Uh, too radical a proposal for the country at this point in time. So I think basically what you're looking at now is either a drop in the eligibility age to allowing people um, 60 years old to to buy into Medicare or a public option, which is regarded as probably the single biggest threat to health insurance industry and to hospitals because of the question of the two major issues that remain unanswered from the Biden proposals, which is how much will providers be paid under a public option? And two, whether provider participation will be mandatory because without mandatory pricing and participation, um, the public option will, will not have a very large effect on total spending. This is according to many studies that have been done, including the one uh, by the Urban Institute, um, which shows that their only uh, savings can be achieved if those two things are in place. So I think for those reasons, the Medicare, lowering the Medicare age to 60 is probably the most politically palatable reform that could be introduced in, in the early days of a, of a new administration. I would definitely agree with that. And I would go further to say that if we were to allow uh, people 60 to 65 buy into Medicare instead of being still dependent on their employer base, a couple of things would be 
would also happen. Number one, um, 60 to 65 could disproportionately be the sicker population in the employed population. So the uh, actuarial premium rates for the commercial population could actually lower as a result of that. Number two, it opens up jobs for other people at a time when we might be more in a recession um, or not, but at least to allow for uh, more job flexibility that some people don't have between that age group. And number three is that um, historically, it's been a challenge to add a la carte benefits to the Medicare program. However, when we did Part D, and added outpatient prescription drugs. We mandated in Congress that there would be no a la carte. You have to join a health plan. So it's like 100% Medicare Advantage Part D. If we are going to increase uh, coverage through Medicare, I think we're going to be looking at more likely 100% Medicare Advantage, which is why I think you're seeing a lot of more Medicare Advantage plans popping up all over the country to get ready to be the, the potential plan they're going to choose in their neighborhood. Medicare Advantage has not really spread across the United States evenly because the marketplace has to be a certain way for it to really thrive. But I think more and more, particularly provider-sponsored health plans, are looking at Medicare Advantage to be able to capture whoever's uh, newly insured. And just one last piece, we are having our uninsured rates grow right now, particularly in the states that did not expand Medicaid. And so as people are either uh, are, are losing their jobs as a result of COVID in particular, uh, they're not being captured in Medicaid. And so I think the combination of the states needing more money for their Medicaid programs and the opportunity even for them to move some of the 60 to 65-year-olds off of Medicaid and into Medicare as the primary payer and making a broader list of dual eligibles is also, I call it the stars are all aligned. The states are interested, the feds are interested, the commercial insurers are interested. Those are the things you have to watch for. You know, Lynn, I, I'd like to make one just quick last observation um, regarding, uh, I guess, tying all of these together. This is a very interesting conversation and there are so many nuances, details, considerations for the four issues we've talked about, which is coverage expansion, coronavirus relief, prescription drug pricing, and surprise billing. And I think what we've also established is that is there's definitely more bipartisan or almost more bipartisan, but there's definitely more demand for action on these issues uh, than there has been for a while. And I think 2021 will see legislative progress on at least some of these issues. But, you know, not putting on my political hat, but my, my former government experience hat, um, to know that when Congress actually thinks they're going to really pass a bill, not just debate it and make noise, but actually pass a bill, they spend enormous time on hashing out the policy and thinking about potential secondary and tertiary effects. And healthcare, major healthcare reform uh, on any of these topics is exhausting for Congress. It is right now on the coronavirus topic. So I only say this to say, I don't think there's capacity in Congress to do all of these issues um, next year. And there may not be capacity in Congress to do all of these issues within a four-year presidential term. Very interesting to see where will the demand come from the public, from Congress, from a new administration or a continued administration to act. I think any of all of these are possible, but um, I, I think realistically, uh, Congress might lose steam if they're lucky enough to make real progress on a couple of these. With that, I think we're going to close off today, so or close out today's conversation. Thank you, Ted, Philo, and Lynn. This is a very enjoyable conversation, and I hope that the listeners got to enjoy it as well. We ran a little bit longer than we typically do, so I'm going to say thank you again, and tune in in November to hear us discuss the Supreme Court case. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to Diagnosing Healthcare. 
For show notes on today's episode, additional episodes, and more insights on trending issues in healthcare, please visit DiagnosingHealthcare.com and be sure to subscribe on your preferred platform. The Employment Law This Week and Diagnosing Healthcare podcasts are presented by Epstein, Becker, and Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances, and these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.